This micro-lecture is on fermentations. This week, we are moving on from chemical conversions to biological conversions. When you have a chance, please look up the Valtra biogas tractor. This is a fairly recent development and potentially very interesting for animal farmers and other types of farmers that have large anaerobic digesters producing biogas. Much like some of the previous considerations about using oil crops to generate oil to support a farmer's fuel needs, this is a way to use decomposable biomass waste to generate natural gas that can also be used to support a farmer's fuel needs. It isn't just oil crops for biodiesel or sugar crops for ethanol anymore. Now we can also use biomass waste to generate compressed natural gas that can be used in engines. Any bioenergy technology that can support fuel needs in the rural areas where biomass is often grown are worth taking a close look at. Having a tractor that can use a modern engine and be powered by something you produce pretty easily from your waste biomass is a great thing. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. This week, we are covering biological conversions, our fourth biomass conversion pathway type. Pathway 4 is biological conversions, and it will be split into fermentations, photosynthetic organisms, and animals. From the chemical perspective, biological conversions are like having an aquarium. It is technically an ecosystem, so you have to consider all the angles and how things will get along. You have to keep everything alive by feeding it and making sure the conditions are correct, and most importantly, you have to keep it wet. Living things don't do dry well, so biological conversions range from wet to completely submerged. Like your aquarium, water is a must. Of the biological conversions available to us, arguably fermentation is used the most for chemicals production. Fermentation is generally the act of feeding microbes in a low oxygen environment so that they will start producing things we want. A lot of microbes can live in oxygen-rich or oxygen-lean environments, but they produce very different things depending on what they are living in, and when it's a low oxygen environment, they start using fermentation pathways. Fermentations can produce a very wide range of products from an even wider range of microbes. It is important that you think about fermentation as a continuum, because you may find that a lot of things seem to be fermentations, and this can make it clearer. An easy way to think about it is apple juice. When you ferment apple juice, microbes eat the easy sugar and make alcohols, acids, and leave tough sugars. If the microbe you used was yeast and you stop here, you have a nice hard cider. If the microbe was something other than yeast and you let it go a little longer, the microbe ecology changes and you become acetogenic. Acetogenic bacteria are very, very effective at eating everything marginally edible and will consume all the alcohols, acids, and tough sugars left from the alcohol step. They combine these with carbon dioxide and they generate acetates and acids, largely acetic acid and propionic acid. So the gist of it is that if you let hard cider ferment a little longer, you end up with apple cider vinegar. Now, while we generally stop here from a food perspective, we don't have to, and the final step is methanogenesis. Methanogens hate oxygen and love acetic acid. It is their preferred feedstock. So if I spike my apple cider vinegar with some aged compost and wait a few days, I will make an anaerobic digester and it will start to produce methane. So think of fermentations as a continuum. Easy sugar turns to hard cider, hard cider turns to vinegar, and vinegar turns to methane. As a side note, the oxygen aspect can be confusing. Fermentation as a microbial process does not require oxygen, but fermentation reactors sometimes utilize oxygen to attain the appropriate growth and reaction rates, or culture dynamics. This is because different microbes respond to oxygen differently. Some are tolerant and some are not, and for most, the presence of oxygen changes what they produce and how fast they grow. To be safe, always start thinking about fermentations as an oxygen-free process that requires sugar to feed the microbes. When you are ready to start thinking about things in a more complex fashion, then it's worth considering what happens when some oxygen is introduced. Anaerobic just means without oxygen, and digestion is another way of saying decompose or break down. So anaerobic digestion means the oxygen-free breakdown of biomass and other digestible things. The primary products of anaerobic digestion are carbon dioxide and methane. 
This is an elaborate image of a modern landfill. Today's advanced landfills seem less like piles of trash and more like integrated bioreactors for decomposition and the production of methane. The trash is the feedstock, and the landfill is engineered to be isolated from the environment as much as possible. Within its walls, there are watering systems to keep things moist, water recycling, a network of tubes and pumps to remove gas, and a wide variety of sensors to help control and optimize the system. Considered from this angle, a modern landfill is really a large bioreactor using microbes to generate biogas. The especially interesting thing is that in many cases this biogas is just wasted instead of captured and used. The anaerobic digestion that happens at a wastewater treatment plant is quite a bit more involved than what happens at a landfill. Anytime you drive by a wastewater treatment plant and see giant white balls or tanks with dome tops, you are probably looking at an anaerobic digester. Using anaerobic digesters at wastewater treatment plants has become almost standard practice if they are large enough because the anaerobic digesters decrease the level of solid waste or sludge that is generated by converting a portion of it into biogas. This biogas can be used to generate steam or electricity depending on the wastewater treatment plant's needs. However, much like landfill gas, it is often just flared to dispose of it. Animal farms generate a lot of waste in the form of manure. They fill huge ponds and tanks with manure, and then they have to figure out what to do with it. Some gets applied to the fields as fertilizer, but generally that only gets rid of a small portion, so the rest has to be converted into something more stable and less toxic. This can be done with an anaerobic digester just like what is done at a wastewater treatment plant. And just like at the wastewater treatment plant, when this is done, it generates biogas. This is why the biogas tractor is so interesting. With more farm needs for biogas, it is possible that less biogas will have to be flared and wasted and could instead be used to support the farm. According to the EPA, each American generates approximately one ton of waste per year. And depending on how you look at this, it is either a tremendous source of gas or an unsustainable situation, or maybe both. If it takes 10 tons of waste to produce enough gas for one household per year, then either that household needs to have 10 people in it generating one ton of waste per year, or it needs to be collecting the trash from the neighbors. It's still worth thinking about because one ton per year of waste is no joke, but it means that anaerobic digestion will probably not completely replace a household's need for natural gas by itself. It would take an additional energy source as well. But it's still a contribution and it's still recycling, so it's absolutely worth considering. An exciting new trend for biogas is upgrading it to compress natural gas. All that is required for this is removal of the water and carbon dioxide, which leaves pretty high quality methane. This methane can then be compressed and used for heating, power, or even vehicles. As gas separation and purification technologies continue to improve, bio-natural gas is expected to play a larger role in our natural gas infrastructure and demands. We just looked at several different ways that microbes are used by society to generate gas products, but equally exciting are some of the microbes that are being used to consume gas products. The first commercial cellulosic ethanol plant in the world is actually based on syngas fermentation. The syngas is produced from biomass waste, and then it is fed to a special microbe that consumes the syngas and excretes ethanol. Syngas fermentations have been studied heavily in the United States since the early 80s, and it is exciting that this technology was utilized in the first cellulosic ethanol facility. The company that built it is a Neos Bio, and the plant is located in Florida. It is worth looking up if you have a chance. Now we'll move away from fermentation gas products and talk about fermentation liquid products. In general, the Pac-Man image here does a pretty good job. Pretend the yeast is Pac-Man and the sugars are those little orange balls. The yeast eats the sugars, and as it eats them, it generates wastes, and one of those wastes is ethanol. Typically, most of the carbon the yeast eats becomes carbon dioxide and more yeast. But a portion of the carbon also turns into ethanol, which is good because that's what we want. When there are too many yeasts and not enough food, the conditions collapse and the yeast die. They don't live very long, so fairly soon after it is no longer reasonable for them to reproduce, they stop living. 
Yeast have played a big role in human history. Bread, beer, and wine are part of a lot of stories. Traditional cellulosic ethanol also uses yeast, just like the yeast you could use for bread and beer. Cellulosic ethanol yeast are often more specialized than that, but those common yeasts available to all of us at the grocery store would still work at some level. The hardest part about cellulosic ethanol isn't making the microbe make ethanol. It's figuring out how to turn the cellulosic biomass into sugars that you can feed the microbe. If you don't give that microbe sugars, it won't live. Economically turning the cellulose into sugars a microbe wants to eat has taken more than a decade of hard work by thousands and thousands of people. Cellulosic ethanol is finally here. There are two officially commercial plants, the Aeneos Bio Plant in Florida, which opened in July 2013, and the Beta Renewables Plant in Italy, which opened in October 2013. Two more plants are supposed to be open and functional this coming fall 2014. The Poet Plant and the Abengoa Plant are both located in the Midwest. There is a joke that cellulosic ethanol has been five years away for 20 years, but it's no longer a joke and that is exciting. Enzyme costs have plummeted and operations have become more efficient and now it is economic to do what was once just a neat idea or a joke. It will be interesting to see what other bioenergy developments occur because of this paradigm change. We are very good at engineering new yeasts and bacteria to do our bidding. Many of the delicious foods in the grocery store today are based on biological conversions. Cheese, yogurt, soy sauce, pepperoni, salami, wine, beer, and vinegar are a few of the more well-known products, but there are many, many more. The production of these products is big business, so there is a large market for improved microbes and bioreactors that make more, faster, and cheaper. The industrial microbiology field is constantly advancing and growing. So far, we have talked primarily about yeast, which are a fungus. However, in addition to yeast, there are some big developments happening with bacteria. A lot of the foods described in the previous slide are bacterial. And while yeast are very useful, they are also somewhat limiting compared to bacteria. Bacteria grow faster and have the potential to produce a much wider suite of products than yeast. They also eat more things and live in a wider range of conditions. As a result, bacterial conversions are becoming more and more popular for bioenergy. A good example of this is a company called LS9 that has engineered E. coli bacteria that produce long-chain fatty acids. They were founded in 2005 and have been able to secure tens of millions in investment and are working hard to develop other E. coli strains for various fuels and chemicals. Biobutanol has been a fast-moving bioenergy area for about 10 years now. It uses a bacteria called Clostridium instead of a yeast, but otherwise uses pretty much all the same processes as a corn ethanol facility. The great thing about butanol is that it is quite a bit more valuable than ethanol, and it can technically be used as a drop-in gasoline substitute. However, it's worth more as a chemical than a fuel, so its role as a biofuel might not be as clear as some think. The fact that butanol technology can take advantage of 90% of the existing equipment at a corn ethanol facility is a huge deal, because if the market for ethanol gets soft and these facilities close down, it is very possible they could become economic again by generating butanol instead of ethanol. The future for butanol seems fairly robust. Another very fascinating microbial development is the use of acetogens, the bacteria that make the vinegar. The acetic acid in vinegar is what gives it that bite. So if you are making vinegar, you are making acetic acid. The first neat thing about acetogens is that they are willing to eat a much wider variety of things than a yeast so you don't have to throw away so much of the biomass. The second neat thing is that they don't generate carbon dioxide like yeast and methanogens, so they convert more of the sugar to desired products than either yeasts or methanogens. Companies like Ziachem that are using clever, underappreciated aspects of fermentation have a lot to gain from the efficiencies offered by the acetogenic process. This will be an area to watch closely in the future. Microbes are tiny little factories. You provide the house and food, and they provide more factories, and also some product. 
It is imperative that we remember when we are using biological conversions that living things do not exist to produce stuff for us, even the genetically engineered ones. They can produce things for us if we feed them and provide a healthy environment, but they exist to replicate, not to make chemicals. We find chemicals in and around certain living things, but living things are by no means an engineered process like chemical and thermal conversions. When you have a chance, please visit some of the attached links and learn about Animox bacteria and the super neat molecule Laterain. Laterains have significant potential as specialized biofuels and could have many material science applications. These highly energetic molecules, with a carbon backbone consisting of linear cyclobutane rings, are part of special membranes in Animox bacteria. Fuels and energetic materials made out of laterains would have outstanding performance, so figuring out how to get bacteria to produce this chemical for us is an area of intense interest for many. This is a perfect example of a chemical that is much easier for us to get from a microbe than to try and make ourselves in the lab.